You know, you and I are living through the early decades of a new economy that's turned out to be very disruptive. And there are a lot of reasons for this disruption, but there are two main culprits. Uh, one is digital technology, and the other one is globalization. These two forces combined have really changed the nature of work. They've, they've changed the kinds of jobs that are, that are needed to, uh, today, and they're changing the kinds of jobs that are needed tomorrow. Now, as a college president, as a college administrator, I think about this a lot because we want to prepare our students for jobs that are on the rise and not jobs that are in decline. Uh, there was a study released uh, just this year at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, and I really like the, uh, the study because it took a look at all the jobs in the United States and Europe, and it lumped them into two categories, jobs that are on the rise and jobs that are in decline. And you can see in this, in this green box here, I've summarized uh, the nature of the jobs that are in decline. You can see that in 2016, there were about 150 million, or 153 million jobs in this category. And take a look at 2030, you can see that we will have lost about 23 million jobs in this category, and people working in this category will be experiencing wage stagnation at that time. Now, in contrast, in the purple, in the purple box, you can see that there were about, uh, what, 160 million jobs in that category. And by the time we get to 2030, we will have added about 38 million new jobs in this category. And people working in this green or in this purple box will be experiencing really healthy wages. Globalization and digital technology are really driving these trends. And as these trends accelerate, and they are accelerating, what we're going to find is this purple box is going to grow and this uh, uh, green box is going to continue to shrink over time. Now, when I tend to look at the jobs that are in this purple box, and they, and they include, these jobs include things like technology expertise, people skills, high levels of cognition, high skill and creativity. When I tend to look at these skills, I have a sense of optimism about what's coming because I've spent my entire professional career in this kind of purple box. My wife has a career in this purple box. Uh, um, you know, my kids are preparing for careers in this purple, but most of my friends and colleagues, purple. Now, if you're in this green box, if you are doing work that requires manual skills, low levels of cognition, if you're doing work that requires repetitive tasks or low level skills, you have a completely different experience. What you're experiencing is a sense of job loss or the fear of job loss. You're experiencing possibly community blight you're experiencing economic hardship. And this is particularly hitting areas in the United States that are rural and urban. It's hitting those areas very, very hard. If you think I'm exaggerating, if you think I'm overblowing this, what I would recommend you do is you listen to the American electorate, especially listen to voices that are coming from this, uh, this green box. They're upset, they're angry, they're worried, they're, they're watching their, uh, their, their livelihoods diminish while they watch people in these purple boxes prosper and grow. I mean, the volume of their political rhetoric has just punched through the traditional ceiling of our civic dialogue, and they are yelling. Now, you and I, we need to hear them. We need to hear them, and we need to respond with a sense of urgency, and we need to respond with solutions that are practical, creative, expansive, and most importantly, scalable. If we do not respond, millions of people are going to get stuck in this shrinking green box, and they will suffer for a generation. This is a national crisis. We need to figure out how to move millions of people from this green box into this purple box. Now, it's going to take a lot of us from multiple sectors, but I believe the lead sector on this should be higher education, which we'll get to in just a second. But first, you need to understand how difficult it is to move from this green box to this purple box. It's a heavy lift for anybody to do this. The reason is, we are all born into a trajectory for our lives. It's a very, very strong suggestion about where our lives are going to go. And the reason it's a strong suggestion is because we have these things called socializing agents in our lives uh, suggesting the direction we should go. And this is just a fancy sociological term. Uh, it, it really uh, refers to your parents and your cousins and your aunts and your uncles and your siblings and your friends and your neighbors and your coaches and your teachers and all those people 
in our lives. And because Americans like to live in similar socioeconomic communities, all those voices in our lives have a very consistent message. And they tend to say, uh, you know, who we are. They help us determine who we are and what we can become and where we're going to go. And that leads us to a set of jobs or a set of skills that we develop. And, and it leads us to a likely number of, uh, of jobs that we're going to take on in our life. Now, I'm not saying all of you have, no, you know, no control over how your life develops. What I'm saying is that these people have a tremendous amount of influence over our lives, especially during our formative years. Now, here's what we're trying to do in higher ed. At least this is one of the major things we're trying to do. We're trying to find students who are on these green trajectories leading to declining jobs. We're trying to interrupt that trajectory and move them into these purple tra trajectories that lead to growing jobs. And our basic strategy is to surround them with new socializing agents that give them a new sense of who they can be, who they are, what they have to offer the world. Let me give you an example of, uh, uh, of this and how, how uh, there are a number of examples like this, but Brenda Lopez is a great example. I, I had the opportunity to meet her uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Brenda was born in Mexico. She lived there till she was six years old. And then uh, her whole family moved to Southern California, where Brenda attended elementary school, middle school, and high school. And after high school, she enrolled at Norco College, where I was president at the time. Now, Brenda was raised by a family that just loved her to tears, man. They, uh, if, you, if you met her family, you can tell they love her. They also raised her in a very traditional family. So when she came to Norco, she had a fairly limited, she, she did, she had a limited view on what she might be able to become, what she might be able to offer the world. So she started taking classes with that kind of mindset. Now, very quickly, what she found out is that she's really good at math and science. I mean, better than most of the other students. So she started hanging around with a bunch of math and science students. She joined a club called the STEM Club, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Club. A couple of faculty members, a couple of staff members became very interested in her academic success, and she declared herself as an engineering major. Now, I, I just love that she declared herself as an engineering major because she told me uh, once in a conversation when she was growing up, she had no idea there was such a thing as engineering. She, no idea. And she just discovered this discipline when she went to college, and she decided to major in engineering. Now, as an engineering student, uh, she and some friends from the STEM club they entered a competition at uh, UC Riverside. And she enjoyed that experience so much that the following year, she re-entered the competition. This time she put her own team together. She was the captain of the team. And in the competition, they designed this, uh, this little uh, wind turbine. And the wind would hit the blades and, and it would spin and, and generate electricity. And she designed it in a very unique way. She used these really strong magnets in her design so that it really lowered uh, the resistance and the friction in the whole system. And it ended up being the most efficient uh, wind turbine in the whole competition. Well, she and her team won first place at this, uh, this competition. This is a community college group of students winning this competition at a, at a university. And we were, so, we were so proud of her. And uh, you know, this, this is so typically Brenda. She was very successful at Norco. She ended up transferring to the Bourne School of Engineering at uh, UC Riverside. And I just spoke with her a couple of weeks. She's working on her, her last year at uh, UCR right now and planning on, on heading to grad school, applying to grad school. Now, I love, I love this story because it's about a young woman who worked very hard to change the trajectory of her life. And it's about a whole bunch of people that also wrap themselves around her to help her change the trajectory of her life. This is a very important story. This is a story that needs to be replicated with much greater frequency across higher ed, especially at the institutions where people like Brenda are attending, but it's not happening frequently enough. There are millions of students, millions of students, who have a similar background, similar story to Brenda's, and they start a journey just like Brenda's every year, and less than 15% of them, less than 15% of them complete the journey that uh, Brenda's completing this year. There are a number of reasons for this, but I, I believe one of the biggest reasons is they're trying to make this trajectory change largely by themselves, largely alone. You see, most of these students, they come from uh, families that uh, have 
low and moderate incomes, right? So they're sending their students to large, uh, large public schools, and most of them are going to community colleges where I've spent my entire professional career. Now, at these community colleges, these students are going down this path, and they've got hundreds of hurdles out in front of them, hurdles that they need to get over if they're going to change the trajectory of their lives. Now, they're at commuter schools, meaning they live at home, they go to work, and they go back home. And when they go back home, they're, they're in a community of people that love them, but very often, they're in a family where nobody's gone to college, nobody. So how would, how would they know how to help them uh, get over these hurdles. Nobody's on a purple trajectory in this family. How would they know to help them get over these hurdles? And then when they're on campus, they run into this problem where there's about 100 students at some of these community colleges, 100 students for every one faculty member. You know, at Harvard, there's about six or seven students for every one faculty member. 100 to 1 is the ratio there. So these students are going this path, down this pathway. There's, it's difficult for them to find people to help them out. It's difficult for us at the community college to keep track of everybody. When I was a faculty member, I had between 800 and 1,000 students per year. I just couldn't keep track of everything that's going on in these students' lives. They're largely going down these pathways alone and therefore finding uh, success to be very difficult. Now, we need to interrupt this. The obvious way, I would love to do the obvious way here. It's just hire a whole bunch more faculty members and a bunch of classified uh, folks and just surround students. But these are publicly funded institutions. It's just not realistic. There's not uh, that kind of taxpayer money for that. So what we need to do is we need to leverage existing technology and we need to leverage existing uh, uh, social networks. So let me, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Or, or, or talk about what I'm uh, wanna, what I get to here. Um, with regard to technology, there are a number of companies that have already faced a similar problem, and they've been able to address this. By, by a similar problem, I mean they have a whole bunch of customers, they have relatively few employees, but they're able to give those customers a very individualized experience. I'll give you an example. I, I bet everybody in this room will, will recognize this. Uh, think about Facebook for a minute, all right? Now, Facebook has about 35,600 employees. I, like, that's a lot of employees, right? But they have 2.6 billion, billion with a B, consumers, users, people that log into Facebook. That's, that's, that's a 75,000 customer to employee ratio. That's crazy. However, every single time I log into Facebook, I get an individualized, customized, curated, fairly intense experience. I never feel like I'm lost in that uh, 2.6 billion uh, user community. It's, it's individualized for me. What they're basically doing is this here. They're collecting a whole bunch of data about me from all kinds of different data sets. Then they're taking that data and aggregating it, and they're analyzing it with artificial intelligence to create some kind of information that they think I might like to consume. And then they're sending that information to me through some kind of platform or communications channel. This is a model that a number of companies have been able to use, and we need to replicate this in higher ed. We already collect all kinds of data about students. We collect academic data and student engagement data and contact information, financial. We need to collect all that data, aggregate it, analyze it with artificial intelligence, and create, uh, create some information that tells us where the student is on their journey, where the student needs to be on their journey, and what the college needs to do, and what the individual student needs to do to close that gap, and then communicate that to the student, like this student Trevor here up on this screen. If we're able to implement this, Trevor will feel much more informed than he ever has, and much less alone. If we can implement this across higher ed, it'll change the lives for millions of students. But if we really want to be powerful, I mean, very, very powerful in our effect, there's one more step that we need to take. And that is we need to incorporate the socializing agents into this process. So to explain this, let me introduce you to Alicia here. Alicia is a uh, brand new college student. She's a little bit like Brenda. She's the first person to go, to go to college in her family. Her family's very proud of her. And she's at a community college, and she's got all these mixed emotions. She's, she's not sure if she's going to be successful. She's very happy what she's doing. Just all, a whole bunch of stuff going on in her life. Now, there are eight people in her life right now. You can see them on the screen. 
eight people, these are the most important people in her life right now in terms of, of her academic success. These are the eight people that are her cheerleaders. They're encouraging her all the time. It includes a couple faculty members, a couple students, an uncle, a sister. She even keeps in contact with a, with a coach from high school. These are, these are the people that root for her. You know, in that previous slide where, where I said we have uh, the data that we collect about students, and then we turn that into information about how they need to be successful, and then, and then we communicate to her. We need to take that same information, repackage it just a little bit, and send it to these socializing agents so they can communicate with, uh, with Alicia and, and encourage Alicia in a much more informed way. So just for a second here, I want you to imagine, to get, get, get this point across, I want you to imagine you're one of these eight people. So look at the screen right now and pick out one of them. Imagine you're this person. All right, now you're an Alicia cheerleader, all right? You're a fan. Now imagine you get an email from her college, and that email says, hey, uh, Alicia just made the dean's list, and it explains what the dean's list is and how hard it is to make the dean's list and what an honor it is to, to make the dean's list. And, and in that uh, email, there's a little hyperlink that you could click on that hyperlink. And if you click on it, it'll post all this information to social media. And you know if you post it to social media, you're going to tag Alicia. And if you tag Alicia, all hundreds of people are going to say, way to go, Alicia. Good job. You made the dean's list. We knew you could do it. So proud. Are you going to click on that hyperlink? No. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know you. And I know you're going to click on that hyperlink. That's what human beings do. We love to help people who, are, who, we're, who we're rooting for. Now imagine in another instance, you got an email that said, uh, Alicia is demonstrating uh, patterns of discouragement and, and you should probably reach out to her. Are you going to reach out to her in that situation? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to do that too. You're not going to blast it all over social media, but you're going to maybe send her an email or take her out to lunch or something like that. We have millions of students in the United States that are starting journeys. They come from similar backgrounds. They're trying to confront all kinds of hurdles to change the trajectory of their lives. And they're doing this alone and therefore likely to not find success. You and I as human beings, we're just not wired to do difficult things alone. We need each other. I know you know this. So if you're an educator, I'd like to encourage you to think about this. These students need you to think about this and do more than that, implement this. If you're in the tech sector, you've already done very elegant solutions in, in the private sector. These students need you to translate all of that work into higher ed so they can enjoy the benefits of that technology. If you're a policymaker, if you're a philanthropist, if you're in the nonprofit space working with higher ed, these students need you to prioritize this work and fund it. And if you're none of those, if you're just a person that wants to help other people, you might know a student right now that you're thinking of in your head that has a comes from a background like this. I'd like you right now in your seat to decide you're going to reach out to that student and you're going to offer to walk with them and help them get over a few of these hurdles. If you can become an active socializing agent in these students' lives, you can change their lives. And in the end, it might change your life too. Thank you very much.